Hi, this is Rudy Besikoff, president of Laney College and host of the President's Desk podcast, heard on 96.9 KGPC right here in Oakland, or online anytime at kgpc969.org. On June 27th, 2023, had a great show uh, as Felicia and I welcomed in uh, Laney College Faculty Senate Vice President and Student Accessibility Services Coordinator, Dr. Nathan Failing, along with Dean of Liberal Arts, Beth Marr. We had an engaging conversation throughout, and we began with a discussion about what life was like for both of these employees as they came on just at the onset of the pandemic and the great things that happened with both of their offices moving forward. This was a conversation that was interactive and moved several different directions, and I certainly hope you enjoy it. And our broadcast began by us uh, talking with Felicia Bridges, who co-hosts the show with me. Enjoy. Back in, say, March, April of 2020, when, when everything was shut down, what was KGPC like? KGPC was actually on autopilot. So in the 15-year history of the station, everything that was ever produced or played at the station was just on a rotation. So just so just a kind of a continuous loop we were of things. Just recycling old shows just over and over and oh, over okay. again. Okay. All so right. Over 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 a thousand. So you could listen to the same thing conceivably. So was there a discussion? <laughs> the same week. <laughs> was there a discussion about the job that President Jimmy Carter is doing? Was it was that part of it? <laughs> Almost. Oh, okay. Any activity that happened fifteen years ago, it was on. <laughs> was there anything as you were listening, you were like, Oh my goodness, that is dated. Uh, was there anything that st stands out? Hmm. Um no, maybe some of the music shows were a mm -hmm. bit dated. Okay. But other than that, it just okay there were no updates about the beatles breaking up were there <laughs> almost but no. no no okay i got it all right so i'm actually going to bring in this is an interesting point to bring in our guest dr nate failing and i'm also going to uh invite to the conversation i'll we'll be talking in the second part of the show uh our dean of liberal arts beth marr i'm, I'm going to ask um nate uh, welcome to the show first of all um when you were kind of 100% oh, lock yeah when you were in 100% lockdown and the whole world was kind of not going on and there were no professional sports or no no events or, or current movies and things what were you doing to kind of keep yourself entertained um <laughs> i was uh only 6 months into working at Laney so i was doing all the cleanup that was necessary for our SAS to move forward right our student yeah, well, accessibility services office yeah um we had and equity and trying to get everything in the right direction so which it worked <laughs> okay so you you kind of never went away that's what it sounds no. like yeah okay i mean i just did it for my uh mm -hmm. not my recliner but my uh, exercise bike my fit fit desk out in the garage that's uh, right yes and it was quite a sight to go to meetings with you and kind of see you riding your stationary bike as you were talking <laughs> to me i certainly remember that beth how are you today and welcome to the president's desk thanks for having me i'm super yeah happy to be here yeah what were you kind of doing or what just in terms of entertainment especially on full lockdown what was what was going on well I don't know if you remember Rudy but I started this job March 2nd of 2020 so I was as you said I think drinking from the fire hose yes yeah so that's a, I was that is like a Rudy that. that is a Rudy yeah. wait I don't, I don't get it what does it mean <laughs> it just means I was new to the job to begin with and then in eight days we went oh. on lockdown so yeah. everything was coming at me a million miles got an it, hour it. so it was a little overwhelming so mostly I worked oh okay and it was great because I was at home and I could still see my family but I worked almost all the time okay wow so not not just me but uh, so uh, Nate so glad to have you on the show and welcome back um, I know a lot of exciting things have been happening in student accessibility services and what have student numbers been like in, in the past year, two years? Can you tell us a little bit about that just to get started? Um, yeah, no, definitely. And, uh, you know, happy to be here. And uh, our numbers have nearly doubled since uh, my hiring back in August of 2019, you know, where we were at around 700, a little bit into 700. And, and we were never as though we were the largest campus between the four. We hadn't been number one in many years of student service. And now we are at over 1,350 students. 
serviced this last year, summer, fall, spring. So it's been a, it's been an impressive work by the SAS team, all of them. So everybody. just so just to fam- just to familiarize our listeners, what is Student Accessibility Services, and what does it do for Laney College students? Uh, student accessibility is exactly that accessibility for those with learning challenges, those that come in with IEPs, so individual education plans from the high schools, um, 504 plans, uh, mental health. Um, you know, physical ailments that make learning a challenge, you know, whether it be trying to write something or even moving, turning a page. So we have audio books. We have, uh, you know, taking extra time on tests. Uh, since we do have visually impaired students, we have even trying to figure out uh, getting assistance in uh, helping the students proctor their tests. So, uh, so we do a lot of things for the students when they come in with some sort of a verifiable disability but we look at challenges that they have and then take each student holistically. Nate, I have a question. You were talking about the increase in students. What do you think is the contributor to that? It is a many, there are many aspects to the reason. Um, First and foremost, when uh, the campus was made fall is free challenges and so It was a huge factor. Fall is free, spring is free. And then the other thing too is during those those years in the pandemic, I did, my department did a huge job of reaching out to other deans, other department chairs, department meetings um, to let the uh, faculty and everybody know that we're there for the students and we're there for them. So that outreach, inreach mindset really got the, the talk going. So people were more comfortable to refer them to to our department. And I believe that that was a major contributing factor along with the the fall and spring being free, opening up the door to help the students. And then lastly, the outreach we did with the community was huge. The disability, the number of consortiums that we sit on, the number of outreach and programs we're doing for those students has really helped increase our numbers almost, you know, probably an extra 50 to 60% just from that. So it sounds like either virtually or physically, you were hitting the pavement and kind of getting out there in the community. I'm going to say it's been a team effort. I mean, this is, we did it. And, but it was also a team from the whole campus as well. It was hitting the pavement and getting everybody informed. You mentioned the team, who's on it? You walk in our door, you see Alex Cervantes. He's our front desk, myself as well. Jack Smith, Miriam, Zamora, Irina, and and then our alt media is uh, Alexandra Seifer. And we look forward to having her back at some time soon, but she's been working remote. Sydney Wong, who teaches a class as well as does counseling. Jessica Oyoung and Jim Joya was with us, but uh, he is retiring for the second time. Then we go over to the test proctor, which has been an asset for our students and our test proctoring room, it's Chelsea. And then keeping our high tech center doors open has been Kim Kale. And she's been really great for as an assistive technology specialist. We have a team, and then we have interpreters Sounds like it. left yeah. and right that are out there. So it's been a great time. Nate, I'd like to go ahead and bring Dean Beth Marr into the conversation because, uh, Beth, I know you've also been in the classroom. What has it meant to have an office like Student Accessibility Services just available as an instructor and then also even as a dean? Instructors interface with Nate and his team all the time. So often what happens is a student who needs accommodations of some kind for their class will be working with Nate before they enter the classroom or people on his team. And then they can all work together with the instructor and work out exact accommodations for that specific class. And that communications as far as I've seen as a dean goes really smoothly, very proactive, lots of great communication. The other place where I've seen it as an instructor is I might have had a student that I see really struggling beyond my ability to assist them with academic tutoring. And I can then refer them to the SAS services and they can get at least some guidance and recommendations there, if not a full diagnosis no, it, or something It's great like to that. see our program so plugged into yeah. SAS this way. Yeah, I know Randy had a question though. Yeah, I well. had a quick question. So as far as the classroom experience, are they still participate in everything with classes and then they go to the SAS for any additional assistance they may need or how does that work? 
So what we do is we try to level the playing field with accommodations. We do not do any fundamental alteration. Like if you're in a K-12, the students with IEPs might go into a special room on the side to finish their homework. The students are expected to do everything that a general student without accommodations, they just might get extra time on assignments, or at, which is really not mandated, but it is part of the accommodations. They might get extra time on tests, audio books, access to our, our personal high tech center for those students. We do offer tutoring from our side, but they really are expected to do everything in the classroom. And then they would come to us if they need extra things like the tutoring that's specifically for them. So pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Nate Failing as well as Dean Beth Marr right here at the President's Desk on 96.9 KGPC. Nate, just knowing you as I do, certainly your efforts to raise awareness for students with disabilities has been, you know, obviously that's something very high on your list. As you've gone through, uh, whether it's our college or our community to raise awareness, what are some experiences that you've had doing that? It's been great. This is, Laney College has been one of the most welcoming environments and inclusive because our, our faculty and our staff want to help our students. They want to, and that's, the th and so, when they have questions about the accommodations, when they have, I try to help them make them feel welcome to come and ask questions. And they most, we usually average at least one instructor per week, sometimes more asking questions like, how do I best serve this student? And all the verification of disability is confidential. We do not tell the instructors anything. We just talk about what the accommodation is and how to best work with those and work with the student. And the feedback I've been getting has been great. The instructors want to be helpful. And, and the staff have been like, hey, I've got students, can, how can we help them? And then we try and figure out from our department, our team decides how to best do it as well. I also know that you've made a lot of efforts to raise awareness among our faculty and staff through professional development sessions, things like that. What are some key points that you hit when you meet with college employees, especially faculty? There's been only maybe one or two that kind of make me question a couple of things. I have to educate them a little bit more, but everybody seems welcoming they want to see how they can do better for the students. We are part of a really great community. And when I say community in the sense of like our faculty and our staff, they want to figure out how to best support them, but support the students and then how SAS can support them. So it is a three-way aspect, students, faculty and staff, and then SAS. And it's all of us working together in this village for the best support of the students. Nate, I have a question. This is a, a bit of confession on my part. I was diagnosed with a learning disability, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I was able to recognize and get evaluated for that disability. What do students do as adults to get, how do they get a vet? Because one of my struggles was trying to find somebody who, some place where I could go to get evaluated to identify what my actual issues were in learning. So does SAS provide evaluation to help students identify exactly where their problems lie? Then we will be hiring an LD specialist that would be the person that does the testing and help identify the learning challenges that many of our students who've fallen through the cracks in many aspects. You know, they were able to get through life through K-12 and they've offset a lot of things, but life hits them and they realize I'm really struggling here and I can't catch up. And that's what the LD specialists that we're hoping to hire will be able to do for our students. Excellent. Well, Nate, as you said, I know you got a train to catch and it's a busy day today. Really appreciate you stopping by the president's desk just to talk about things and congratulations just on the expansion of the program and that we're serving so many more students. I do appreciate definitely you know, being invited to this. I want to make sure I add because Dean Beth over here has been a, a very big ally for us in a, several of our little programs that we've been creating outside for the community to come in. She's one of the big fans and uh, allies for supporting our department, supporting our students. And it's been a pleasure to work with her on this as well as everybody else in regards to our students. So thank you very much for having me. I look forward to another time, hopefully when I'm, and I can actually be on campus because this is a great opportunity. Okay, to welcome back to the second half of the show, Beth Marr.
Beth, could you tell us a little bit about the liberal arts division and some of the areas that you supervise? Sure. Actually, it's perfect timing because we're doing a little reorganization so that the liberal arts division actually aligns with our new areas of interest. So now, starting in July 1st, the liberal arts division will include all the language and communications departments, which is English, ESL, communications, and language related things like legal and court interpreting. And what is legal and community interpreting? You do, sorry, legal and community interpreting. What is that? It's interpreting at public events, mostly in Spanish and English. So it's learning the rules and regulations and codes of conduct and methods of interpreting in a, at a public event. And we're actually expanding that program to have a medical interpreting program in the coming semesters because that is very specific. You know, it was very exciting. A couple of weeks ago at graduation, I got to meet my first legal and community interpreting graduate. Wow. Who not only shared the news of his accomplishment of getting an AA, but also that he had landed a job. So, Excellent. We love so anyway, I interrupted you. You were talking about English, ESOL, uh, our languages, and then legal and community interpreting. What else? And then, of course, we have Japanese, Chinese, French, and Spanish. And Spanish is also expanding to do some indigenous languages, such as Mam and Nahuatl in the coming semesters. So we're really excited about that. The other half of the liberal arts division is the visual and performing arts departments, which is art, music, dance, theater. And now starting this summer is going to include graphic arts, media communications, and photography, which is really a commercial photography program. So super excited to welcome those programs into the division. And now we are clearly aligned by our areas of interest. And I just want to point out that when I say music at Laney, I mean all kinds of music. We have a Chinese orchestra for kids. We have a regular symphony for not just for kids. Many kids take it, but it's for anybody. We have a regular symphony. We have jazz orchestra. We have a mariachi choral instructor. We have music of China. We're really a world music program, and there's a lot of different things going on. Actually, operachi, I believe, is the term. We had, we did have uh. Professor Uyoi on a previous broadcast. Yeah, Dean Beth, I just had a question about, so what does the liberal in front of arts mean? That is a really good question. I think of it, I, I don't really know where it originated as in terms of the word liberal, but for my whole life, when people talk about liberal arts, it's more the general studies as opposed to specific vocational studies. Oh, okay. But that's a really good question. I have to look up the origin no, I, I of why what, we I think a lot of it liberal. was the traditional arts uh, we have, for example, music and art. And I think that liberal arts was essentially an expanding of that definition to include a lot of the other disciplines we find within it, I think, just over time. Because if you think about like traditional education in the arts, it was probably to play an instrument or to paint or something like that. And I think it just it was I think liberal arts essentially was an expansion on that. Right. But it traditionally we think of like a liberal arts, a four year liberal arts college True. is not just art. Right. right. It's all, it's humanities and all things together. So I'm, I'm sort of, now you're going to make me go home and do something. There we go. All right. Always, always happy to give out uh, homework assignments right here at the president's desk on 96.9 KGPC. All right, well, we are into the summer semester, Beth. What can you tell us a little bit about what's happening on campus and what the summer schedule looks like? I am super excited about summer. We start next week. Monday is a holiday, of course, Juneteenth, but classes start on the 20th, and we've got a lot of great things happening. We are still have a lot of summer for Laney students and any college students needing to take some Laney classes. A lot of our classes in summer are still online, but we have many more this summer than in the past three years, classes on campus, which are probably mostly science labs. We have most of our languages are on campus, ESL, the modern languages, and we have an athletics. 
And we have some CE programs also on campus. Career education, wow. Right. Yes. Uh-huh. Career edu- and so the other thing we have this summer is we have a bunch of programs for high school students. So we have our Career Education Institute, which is a really great program. It's mostly full, but it's still exciting to tell you about because it's a way for high school students to come to the college and take some career ed classes like cosmetology or culinary or what was the one of the other? Oh, the eye design, which combines a bunch of our skilled trades programs in one summer. It's like a it's like a teaser kind of. It's a way yes. to take a taste of some of these career education programs, which are generally a year or two years long, but it gives you a taste of what they're like in six weeks as a high school student. So it just gives you another option when you think of your future and what you're going to be doing. So we're really excited about those. We also have a, a new program this summer for high school students called STEM Core Summer Bridge, which is a new program that is doing similar things to helping high school students think about careers in CIS or computer systems. So we're excited. That's new this summer. It's computers and engineering. So we're su- super oh, excited about neat. that. Yeah. That's oh, something it's... that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have one more sure. area that we're focused on this summer, which is we're really opening up the campus to the community. So we've got programming for regular students, college students, taking college classes. We've got things for the high school students. And then we have two new things happening this summer just for the community that anybody can take. And the first one is I'm very excited about. It's a partnership with UC Berkeley's Center for Latin American Studies and Laney College's Latinx Cultural Center. And it's a that mom. That sounds like quite a collaboration. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty. It's very impressive. So Lainey is hosting the workshops. The workshops are all being taught by mom individuals who have lived here in the Bay Area but are very connected to the mom or Mayan culture that they come from in Central America. And the classes are Mayan language or mom language, mom culture, mom weaving. So one of the mothers of one of the instructors is actually teaching the weaving class and this one is my favorite it's mayan math which is a completely different math system than our math system and so you can learn all these cool interesting topics at laney college this summer in our regular summer program if you're interested in anything about this program it's free please contact julia bird Bird is in the bird flying in the sky, except with a Y instead of an I. And it's julia.bird, B-Y-R-D, at berkeley.edu. You can also just contact me at Laney College, which is E as in Elizabeth Marr, M-A-H-E-R, at peralta.edu. And if folks want to call your office, what's the best number? That would be 510-464-3221. You know, uh, just uh, to let Felicia and Randy know, um, Dean Mars' uh, scope of supervision and leadership has been incredible at Laney College. And in addition to the departments that she mentioned within liberal arts, along the way, students sometimes need help during the semester. And and Beth, can you tell us a little bit about, about the student support for tutoring and things like that? Super excited to talk about tutoring. We have We have always had tutoring at Laney. And we now, but it's been in different areas, supervised by many different people and functions. And so we have recently just put it all under one project manager, the fabulous Jennifer Jerry, who has been creating a really streamlined functional process by which we can hire tutors and by which we can disseminate tutors into the college. And so one of our newest ways of working with tutors is to, because we have centers where students can go drop in and meet a tutor or schedule for a tutor, but often we find that the students who seek out tutoring are the students who are really proactive about their learning and sure. know what they want to get help with. And that we also know that there are a lot of students out there who are struggling but don't know how to even ask the question because they don't even know what they need to ask and so they don't go to drop-in tutoring. We really want to make tutoring available to everyone. So we've started what we have called embedded tutoring where we take classes that we anticipate might have a need and we offer embedded tutoring to those instructors and those students. So you're saying the tutors are actually planted in the class. Exactly. So the students are assigned to a class. They meet with the teacher ahead of time. 
they become familiar with the content, the assignments, they know that teacher, they know what is expected on the tests or on the papers, and they can work directly with that teacher and those students. Could you give, give us a couple garden variety examples, typical classes that would likely have an embedded tutor? So I always think, it's not just because it's in my division, but I do think that English 1A is one of our most important single classes. Oh, the transfer level composition class, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. It is the one class that every single student who wants to get a degree must take and pass. And so we see that as a really important class to support. So there's, there's a special version of English 1A, which is called English 1AS, which gives the faculty an extra credit or an extra hour a week to work with students to give them even more support to do the same content, to do the same work as a regular 1A. And all of those sections of English 1AS have embedded tutors. So that means the tutor is going to go to class with the students. So the tutor, the students are going to know this tutor. They're going to sit with that tutor. When they're in small groups, the tutor is going to be walking around and helping. When they have breakout time to do to work on papers or get started on papers, which is often the hardest part, the tutors are going to be like the teacher walking around the class and helping students in real time. Do students also have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with, with the tutor? Exactly. So now they have a relationship with that tutor, right? They know them. They are in class with them every day. And that same tutor is going to be assigned hours to be available to meet with students after class when they have when students may have more time and focus to work on their papers or their assignments and so we have done some evaluation of this type of intervention intervention support and it's very successful because every student is doing it what some things that can help it be even more effective is if the instructor provides an incentive so some instructors give homework credit if you go meet with a tutor oh. some oh. right so there's cash a cash in on that yeah right <laughs> Oh, I was just going to ask, so the tutor will be in the class the whole semester or just at the beginning to kind of get a feel for it? It really depends on the class so and how the teacher runs the class. So most of the classes, for example, in English 1AS, there is a sort of lab component where students are working on assignments every week in class and the tutors are always there. Other classes, we might have the tutors there half of the class time and available outside other time. It just depends on, it's really a relationship between the teacher and the tutor. One thing I will add is that with our new project manager of tutoring, she's she's here all the time and it's her own, you know, that's her main job. We used to have a faculty on release who supported the tutoring, but they were also teaching and had other things going. So this is this has allowed us to really, her role now, she's not just hiring the tutors and supervising them, but she's coaching our teachers. So one of the things that we're starting this fall is she will have sessions with the teachers who have these tutors so that the teachers can learn strategies and ways of working with the tutors. No, great to hear about all this support for students. But I have to ask Randy, what do you remember about your experience taking freshman comp Eng English 1A? Oh man, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it was, I definitely probably could have benefited from having a tutor there because it was kind of like you're just thrown in to start writing papers and stuff and you kind of don't need you know need some assistance feeling your way through it that first time i yeah. definitely find that oftentimes in writing essays i have three kids who are just the last mm -hmm. one just finished high school so i've supported people doing essays a lot and it really feels like so much of it is before you start writing right mm -hmm. is talking through like the big ideas and how what are you going to try to say and then working getting that general idea and like playing around with those ideas and having someone else to bounce those ideas off of yeah. in a, in a yeah. conversation. You know, Beth, if you uh, went around my apartment as a college student, you'd see flashcard after flashcard with idea clusters on them. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Felicia, communications major. I know you took English yes. freshman comp. What do you remember? Yes, I did. Well, I use tutors. And I, I was at UC Berkeley, so I was intimidated as heck. And I had a tutor, which first I would launch my ideals with the tutor. And then once we, I would get assisted with the framework, then I would write it 
and then I would go back to my tutor when it was pretty much complete and then we would review what I wrote and I did pretty well mm -hmm. in composition because leaned on tutors and went back multiple times during papers so yeah. Yeah. I would suggest that with anyone yeah, all I can say is I kept the index card industry in the black <laughs> my whole time. I, I mean, wished just... index cards would work. They work if I were trying mm -hmm. to learn scientific concepts, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I use them for everything. I have, I'm a post-it note person. I have them all, all over. over. Oh, <laughs> I don't think those existed when I was in <laughs> college. But I will just say I, I love what you said about the way you thought of using tutors because I feel like some – I know I was this way when I was in college. I thought – I needed to do it on my own. I didn't think it was legit if I got help. And so I feel like I want to really dispel people of that idea because I feel like I, if I'm writing something really important and I'm almost 60 years old, like I will still have people I trust preview what I write. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not a sign that I can't do it. I just want that feedback, right? Because mm -hmm. writing is so... you you have it in your head and you're trying to communicate something but you have no idea how it's going to land and so having that kind of feedback and that conversation that you can have with a tutor is a, it's not just helping you do that assignment that learning how to use someone else to help you execute your ideas and get them in writing or even for a speech for example sure. that's a skill right Absolutely. and yeah. so developing your practice of using tutors while you're at Laney is a great way to develop yeah. that skill. No. It kind of reminds me of like being a journalism major. It's kind of like reminds me of an editor. Exactly. Whereas, you know, you're, you wrote something and then they take a look at it and kind of give you the feedback on what to yeah. add or take out. Or And that's if you stay as a journalist, that's you're always going to do that. Yeah. yeah. Right? So pleased to be talking. As a former journalist, yeah. that, that happened no, absolutely. for me. Yeah, so pleased to be talking with uh, Dean Beth Marr right here at the president's desk on 96.9 KGPC. So Beth, I know you were in the classroom and, and you taught English uh, as a second language or English for speakers of other languages and then took a bold step and moved into leadership. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that period of time and what led you to kind of take on that role? Sure. I taught ESL as we used to call it in some places. Me too. Still too. <laughs> and now at Laney we call it English for speakers of other languages because it is not the second. It is often the third or fourth language for a lot of students. For about 35 years in the Bay Area in all kinds of settings, and I loved it. It was a calling. It was a passion for me. And through some of the opportunities that I had at Laney, I was able to do additional work as kind of a project manager and I was able to work with an idea of a project and then run a pilot of it and then see it become institutionalized at the, the college level. And that was super exciting. And when I looked at my career, I really loved being in the classroom, but each semester sort of began and ended and then started over again. Right. And there wasn't a sense for me learning over time. And so being able to be involved with projects that may be a few years in the making and then a few more years in the running was a way to have a sense of accomplishment over time. What were some of those initial projects? So years ago, I worked for the then Dean of uh, Career Education, Peter Crabtree, working on a cohort-based program in the machining department where we it, were really reaching into the community and trying to find students who might be really um, suited for this kind of work but might not find their way to the college. And it was a, a cohort-based model, meaning we recruited them, they all took the, the, the classes together, we gave them lunch, we gave them bus passes, we had all kinds of extra field trips and things like that, so it was a tight unit. And we ran that for about three or four years. It was okay. super exciting and satisfying. Okay, excellent. You talked about projects. So what projects are you working on that are? Oh, oh right now, yeah. yeah. I have a lot of projects. <laughs> <laughs> One really great project that is kind of in its mid-stride 
is a collaboration with our partners, the Lau Family Development Center. Oh, great which, partners of Laney, yeah, Lau Family Foundation. Excellent. In fact, you should have my quatch on here sometime because she's she is a fireball. She gets a lot of things done in Oakland, but they're an amazing agency that does all kinds of social so, social services, mostly for refugees. So we wanted to work with them and we went into partnership on a grant and so we run a, what we're calling a pre-employment ESOL program. So it's ESOL classes all together in a cohort, eight weeks for very recently arrived refugees and they take classes on technology, job search, customer service and sort of basic what is college in the US and how does it relate to work. Yeah, that's, no, it's amazing. And I, uh, Felicia, just to let you know, uh, my first year as a president, I came in and uh, the Lau Foundation effectively paid the salaries of all our student workers during my first year as a president. That's that's how engaged they've been in Laney and Peralta. And they, just in terms of what we want to do and what they do for our community, we align. And, and it's really tremendous to have a partner. And I certainly will be inviting May at some point to come and talk to us. Yeah. I'd like to shift a little bit to the subject of leadership, and I'm going to actually go to Randy first. As a student leader this year, what are some things about leadership that you've learned along the way? I've learned that as a leader, people are going to look to you kind of for direction and answers. So I've had to kind of get my mind to where I'm prepared to answer any questions that may come up that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> Anything you feel that you, besides getting more knowledgeable about things, but is there anything skill-wise you feel like you've picked up or maybe something that was already there that you find yourself drawing on? I definitely feel like I've drawn on my communication skills a lot more, especially coming out of the pandemic. It's like you didn't really have that interaction with people face-to-face -face or one-on-one. -on -one, and so I definitely feel like my communication skills have gotten a lot better. Okay. If somebody asked you about your style as a student leader, what would you say? Um, I would say I'm pretty casual, laid back. I'm very easy to approach. I think I am. <laughs> I, well, I don't know, Felicia. During show <laughs> prep, I thought, you, no, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, now let's go ahead and transition over to our dean. Just, Beth, as you've come into leadership, and uh, certainly just talking about the projects that you undertook, and, and kind of a lot like when I was an ESL professor, I was taking on the Learning Center, I was on the Senate, doing a number of those things. But... What is it that you find you really enjoy about leadership? I'm kind of no, nosy isn't quite the right word, but I want to know everything that's going on. You do. <laughs> so I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get to, in this role, I get to know a lot. My, what my challenge is, is that I don't have to be doing it all. Like I, right. I want to get in there and be involved in everything exciting that I see and hear about that is happening on campus. And I'm learning how to be like, that is exciting and awesome and I can just support from the sidelines. <laughs> I'm so. not really asking for a textbook answer here, but what would you say your style or approach to leadership is? I feel like I'm still working that out, but I hope that I am approachable and that the people who I work with see me as a resource because I feel like that as a dean you're really sort of what we call in the business world middle management right so I'm in a position where I can do some things but mostly what I can do is help connect the faculty and staff who work in my areas to other resources on campus and that's what I try to do is support the programs that are in my division. Sure. Dean Beth when I think of liberal arts I think about characters and people who are passionate about, <laughs> about about the arts and what they're teaching and so forth. Oh, they are. How do you <laughs> wrangle all of that <laughs> to get what? things accomplished and to create goals and aspirations with people who are just That's creative? That's a perfect question, though, because it is true. Our, I mean, I think of our theater, our dance, our art instructors are incredibly mm -hmm. passionate and they love what they do and they make amazing things with students. And I have the most phenomenal staff assistant who has all the paperwork, all the documentation. She doesn't care in what form these artists bring the things that we need to deliver to the college, she will make them into the right form, right? So I have her who's very, very organized and can help us take the concepts that may come in in a, I have one faculty who sends 
almost all of his missives to me and on my staff assistant are in haiku form. Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I know I the, can imagine. I know the colleague of whom you speak. And I get the most amazing missives from this. He is always working to make his students connected and out in the community and and will send me over Christmas vacation text after text of the news he heard of this student and this alum and this student and so I, his passion is there and my job is to help you know there are some just very functional paperwork you know processes things that we have to do on our end and he's doing what he needs to be doing and I support him 100%, and I will help translate any of that into the paperwork that needs to happen on the office side. Randy and Felicia, I think that's a good future mystery guest for us to have yes. here on the President's <laughs> Desk. I think we, we need to bring this right. colleague of ours in, and uh, I, I, I perhaps he, we can lead off with incredible. a haiku as, as, uh, <laughs> as he joins us, and I'll stop there. But uh, what keeps you up at night as a, as a leader at Laney? <laughs> Do you really want to know, President? <laughs> One thing. <laughs> Um, mostly it's anything that could get in the way of our teachers being in front of our students. So, you know, there are times when our uh, one block of buildings is offline and I need to find a classroom for the class to meet in. So anytime that there is anything when there were the horrible rains we had in January, like yeah. what are we going to do if class is canceled? Are students going to come and not know it's canceled? Like anything that sort of prevents our instructors from being with their students. You know, it's interesting you say that because I remember as a faculty member kind of doing an information interview of my dean to learn about, oh, what, what's it involved to be a dean? And her answer to me was being able to find that extension cord that makes a class work, right. that, that missing extension cord and bringing it in. But what are you finding about like just classes now compared to when you taught Maybe some things have changed. I know, I know from my from my standpoint, and I'm going to date myself a little bit here. I I know it when I started out teaching, I was more a lecturer, and things became a lot more interactive. But what what are some changes that maybe you've noticed? Well, there's the obvious change that so much more is on the computer, right? So even if the class is face to face, all of our faculty now are expert Canvas users. So Canvas is an integral part of even every face-to-face -face class, at least as far as I can tell. And so that's a benefit because those students who are taking face-to-face -face classes are learning Canvas, which means they have access to and the ability to take online classes. So that, and I think there is, because during the pandemic and the shutdown when we were all online, there was just this hunger for connection. So. And maybe it's partly because our fantastic ESOL department are experts at this and have been preaching this style of teaching for years now, mm -hmm. is there's a lot more group interaction and group projects and group work, which I think is really deep. There's deep learning happening there. Yeah. For students who might be listening to the show whose first language is not English, what can you say about the ESOL department? I know from in my own case, when I was teaching at Long Beach City College, it was it was a unique community and I and we did a lot for students. What can you say about it at Laney? I can say to a faculty member in the ESOL department, these teachers are so dedicated to your learning and your life. Like they will to a teacher go out of their way to walk you over to financial aid if you just can't find it or to connect you with the student service on campus that meets the need you're having right at that moment. They are very, very concerned with the whole student, I would okay. say. Now, you may get some graduates, uh, uh, Randy will soon be one, who may come to you and say, you know, I'm interested in teaching, possibly. What would you tell them about it? What, what advice you give? And what might be some cautionary tales <laughs> you might tell? I can't imagine my life without teaching. I found it the most rewarding thing. I think it's one of my children is thinking of going into teaching and I'm I'm thrilled because there's knowing something what did you say journalism yes and then there's sharing that passion and that love with somebody else and then watching them take it places you would never have thought to take it and I feel like I was the teacher 
of the class, but I left every class learning so much about myself, about my students. I loved it. And so now that to your dean, do you miss the classroom? I do. I really do. I love what I'm learning as an administrator, uh -huh. but I do miss the classroom. So any student who comes into my office for any reason, I am just, I wine and dine them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so excited to have them there. <laughs> Well, Beth, we're so glad that you joined us today at the president's desk, and, and I hope you'll consider coming back and talking with us again. Thank uh, I would love to come back. And, and more than anything, as the president of the college, I would like to thank and acknowledge you for your leadership and all that you've meant to Laney. Thank you. All right. Well, Felicia, I know, we, you know we've had an interesting day.